Good morning, Lodi Community Church. We are so happy that you have joined us this morning, whether you're on Facebook or YouTube. We're just glad that you're joining us. And I don't know about you, but it's getting to be a little old, gathering in a sanctuary by ourselves, <laughs> preaching to a camera. It's a little lonely. And um, I'm sure you would rather be here with us. Mm -hmm. The good news is um, we have a plan and we have begun to communicate that plan this last week. If you didn't get the email, it's because you're not on our subscription list. So I would encourage you to go to LodiCommunity.org, go to the bottom of the homepage, put your email so that we can email you um, any updates or weekly emails that we do about the service. But the good news is this, that we have begun meeting in smaller phases, um, in smaller groups, for example, the women's Bible study or a Wednesday night Bible study in person. And yet we're waiting to gather on Sunday morning because on June 15th, the governor is going to release new guidelines for in-person religious services. And we as a leadership thought it was wise to wait and see it until this 21 day initial period was over and to see if there's any more restrictions or um, God willing, if there's any loosening of the restrictions so that we can take all of that into account when we reopen on Father's Day. That's right. Father's Day, June 21st, 10 a.m. right here at Lodi Community Church. We're going to be having our first in-person gathering after COVID-19. And if you've been joining us online, please, we invite you to come. We'll have all of the things necessary to safely open, mm -hmm. hand sanitizer, signage, six foot social distancing. Um, we'll have some face masks available for you. I probably won't wear them while I preach. That would be a little awkward, but if you feel comfortable wearing yours, um, please bring your face mask. We'll have everything according to the guidelines so that we can safely and responsibly meet in person. And hopefully we get some new guidelines June 15th. But I'm really looking forward to us gathering as a church on June 21st, Father's Day. It's going to be a great Father's Day. I can't it wait. Will be. Tara has a few yes. announcements for us. So, um, like you said, we've been gathering in smaller groups. So, Women's Bible Study, we are going to meet this Tuesday at 10 a.m. at Lodi Lake. If you would like information pertaining to that, you can reach out to Pastor Timothy and he can get you in contact with the person to just lead you to where we're meeting at, exactly at Lodi Lake. But it's a great time. Um, you would need to bring your own chair and your own food if you'd like to come and hang out with us for about two hours, I would say. Um, we also are meeting now at 6.30 p.m. for our Wednesday night Bible study here at Lodi Community Church in the sanctuary. It, it was, was great. It, it was, was great. It was such a really great fun time. time. Yeah, it was so great to just see everyone in person and really be able to have great discussions. So if you are able to make it out 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday night, like we've always said, it's family style. If you have children, bring them along. You can keep them at where you're at. Give them things to do, like what we've done with ours. We brought, we brought them this Thursday, excuse me, this Wednesday, and they just were able to just hang out. Um, so, again, we don't want that to be any reason why no one does come. Um, so 6.30 p.m. here at Lodi Community Church. We also are going to be... Um... <laughs> I think we're talking about prayer. It's okay, babe. This is our, like, second take, just to be real. No, I think our third. <laughs> Maybe it's our third. Oh, um, this yeah. is the effects of doing this um, on a Friday night with nobody here. We're just having fun, I guess. And you guys were all here. Yeah. I think mean, I would have just laughed, so, so I have space. I was like, where prayer. are we? We're having prayer Monday through Friday. That's a little change uh -huh. at noon. And we just encourage you to join if you can, even if it's on your lunch break and you work throughout the week. Yes. Just join us. In the, in the time that we are as a country right now, we desperately need to be praying and be praying people. And so just encourage you. Um, if you need the Zoom link, you can message me, find me on Facebook, um, but email me, whatever it is, I'll get you the Zoom link. But really encourage you, if you can, join us in prayer. That's every day, Monday through Friday at noon on Zoom. And I aim at that. Perfect. Um, lastly, we would like to say thank you for those that have given to the mission here at Lodi Community Church. We can't emphasize enough that you are a part of everything that's happening here and everything that will be happening here. So three ways to give, mail in your check, 
Um, if you need the address, you can always find it on Lodi Community Church on our website. Um, oh, it's not Lodi Community Church. I already messed up. It's Lodi Community dot org. Yes, I got it at least a second time. Um, and then you also can text in your giving. That number should be showing up here. Um, and then you can always, like I said, mail in your check. So mail in your check, text in your giving, or give online. Three ways to give. We thank you very much for your generous gifts. And we want to make sure you know that you are definitely a part of the mission that's happening here at Lodi Community Church. Okay, with that, everyone, <laughs> I'm going to go and read the scripture. And we are going to pray. So, okay. Revelations chapter 5, verse 9 to 10. And it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on earth. Father, I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to come and die on the cross for our sins. And because of his blood that was shed, we were all ransomed. And, and at the foot of the cross, we are all seen as one. There is but one God and one son that ransomed each and every one of us from every nation, every tribe, every language, that together we come at the foot of the cross and we worship with one voice singing to our God with a heartfelt song of gratitude and thankfulness. God, I thank you that today as we worship you, that we not just sing mere songs, but that we would open our hearts and that we would have a deeper revelation of what you have done on our behalf and who we are in Christ. Lord, I ask that the message you have given to your servant pastor timothy that would give us a deeper revelation of who you are through the word and that us as a church would respond i thank you father for everything you're doing today and what you will be doing in jesus name amen Paid my debt and raised the 
Raising up the broken to life. I don't know where you are at this morning. Maybe you're broken. Maybe you're weary. Maybe you're just so full of emotions that you don't know what you are. I know for me this last week, with all that's going on in our country, the unrest, the injustice, the constant news coverage, I found myself in just wanting to unplug and run away and be with Jesus. It's overwhelming. And so this morning as we have an opportunity to practice confession, to simply pray out loud how we are really feeling, this can bring healing to our souls. And so every week we put out a digital liturgy. And in there, there's a prayer that I write to kind of capture the moment in our flow of our service. And it's a point of the service where we can confess how we're really doing to God. And I don't know about you, but if you identify with me this morning, then you just are feeling out of control. Mm -hmm. And so this prayer captures that and leads us back to Jesus. And it says this, so if you have the digital liturgy, just pray along with me. Maybe even pray in your own words, but just pray and confess to God this morning how you are doing. Father, I confess that I'm lost. I feel out of control as the world is crying out for justice and peace. The whole creation is groaning longing to be set free from bondage and corruption and obtain the freedom of the children of God. Your image bearers are suffering. Revive us, O Lord, in wrath. Remember mercy. Jesus at the cross, mercy and justice kissed. Open our eyes to the glorious gospel of grace. Savior, be lifted up in this time of crisis. Holy Spirit, awaken the church and open the eyes of our hearts. We pray for a gospel renewal in our churches, city, and country. Lord, we need you. Amen. And so this last song is an opportunity for you to just process those feelings, to seek Jesus while he may be found. And so I pray for you this morning that you would turn your eyes to Jesus and look to him in your time of need. Let's continue to worship.
chapter 2, starting in verse 9. It says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once 
You have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's pray. Father, this morning, this scripture profoundly communicates our part in the story of God. It is truly astonishing what you have called us to be. We are your chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession. God, this is too marvelous for us. Help us this morning understand just how great is our role in the story of God. You are the star. You are the chief cornerstone. But we are the living stones built on you, Jesus, to be a spiritual temple. And so, Father, there's so much here. Help us just glean a little bit this morning to help us in this time in our nation, in our everyday life. Help us to become more and more like Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I don't know about you, but the last week or so has just been brutal. It's been overwhelming to see the pain and the trauma, the brokenness, the injustice, the tears, the rage, the anger, the frustration, the divisiveness, the deception, the emotional outbursts. There's just too much. It's as if we were one tinderbox waiting for something to light us on fire. And with the brutal murder of George Floyd, it seems to have given our country something to burst. And as I've been trying to wrestle with this, and I don't know how you have been wrestling with this and it's a conversation that we should have and continue to have I had an opportunity this last week to meet with the Lodi pastors and it's a conversation it's a discussion that everyone is wrestling with everyone is trying to find their ground and just how to navigate these uncharted waters it's challenging to say the least and yet as I was watching newscast after newscast, I stumbled upon our governor on June 1st saying something that just gripped me, and it really captured something that I had been thinking through about how to move forward and, and why the church is so essential and why I'm so excited to be gathering in person in the days ahead. And on June 1st, in one of his noon press conferences, Governor Newsom said this, program passing is not problem solving. He cautioned, you gotta change hearts, minds. You gotta change culture, not just laws. You gotta change hearts. And that's something that I have been wrestling with, that you gotta change hearts, that you cannot legislate Morality. You cannot legislate racism. That There are no laws, no programs that will completely eradicate racism or injustice. Because at the end of the day, in every system, in every government, in every office, in every squad car, everywhere you look, every protest, every march, everywhere you look, you're going to find the human heart. You're going to find a person that has a heart, that has a condition that only the gospel can remedy. You see, I found myself in this week needing some good news. I needed John Krasinski. I needed some good news. <laughs> I needed some good news. And that's exactly what we find in 1 Peter is some good news. You see, what I just read in verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2 is the result of the gospel. It's the result of us being born again. It's the result of us having a change of our heart. It's what we need in order to move forward. 
You see, the good news this morning is that the gospel has the power to change hearts. The gospel has the power to change minds. The gospel, as we've been talking about week after week, the gospel has the power to change our story. It has the power to give us a new identity, something new that defines us other than the things of this world. A new purpose. It has the power to rescue us from this broken world and give us a new song, a new story, something that transcends all the narratives in the news. You see, people are stuck in the wrong story, and that's why it just goes back and forth, back and forth. People are stuck. Like we looked at a few weeks ago, the Apostle Paul was stuck in the wrong story. And yet only the gospel has the power to change the situation. When I heard that from Governor Newsom, I wanted to shout at the TV, the gospel is the answer! Mm-hmm. You've got to change hearts, I agree. But it's the gospel that has the power to change. Even our governor recognizes that laws and programs cannot rescue us these days. It's profound. You see, every single one of us, every single human being, every single image bearer of God, yes, we have inherent dignity and value because of us being image bearers, yet what we find in the scripture in Genesis chapter 3 is that we have all been tainted by sin, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. This is what theologians would call the doctrine of total depravity. And yet the prophet Jeremiah describes this condition like this in chapter 17. I believe it's verse 9. He says this about the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? You see, our human condition is desperately sick. We are desperately sick. Our heart is deceitful above above all things. You see, Governor Newsom was right. You've got to change the heart. The human heart is the problem. Sin is the problem. You see, because the wages of sin is death, we find ourselves, all of us who are outside of Christ, we find ourselves dead in our sin and trespasses. And you see, a dead person doesn't just need a little plastic surgery. A dead person doesn't just need a new change of outfit. A dead person needs a resurrection. A dead heart needs a resurrection. They need to be born again. And that's exactly what this text describes, building up to verses 9 and 10 of chapter 2. It says that we were born again, born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, it's in verse 3 of chapter 1 that Jesus' close friend, Peter, his disciple, his the disciple that was so close to Jesus, says this, according to his great mercy, he has caused us, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, the good news this morning, church, is that resurrection is possible. New life is possible. And in the midst of all of this chaos, and all of the anger, and all of the frustration, and all of the I have no control, and all of the fear that nothing is going to ever change, this morning, the church, you have a solution. You have the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power, when proclaimed, to make dead men alive, to make men born again and give them a new hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We must be born again. And every time I I say that, I'm reminded of my grandpa who was a preacher and his message was, you must be born again. Why? Because that's what every preacher's message should be. You must be born again because it was Jesus's message. You must be born again. And to those born again, they are welcomed to the story of God. And as it says here in verse 22 and 23, and what I'm trying to do, church, is give us some context and get us to verses 9 and 10 this morning. 
But what it says here in verse 22 and 23, and as I read this in study and preparation for the sermon, I went, that's what we need, church. That's it. Look at it, verse 22, chapter 1, 1 Peter. It says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. What does that mean? It means because you believe the gospel. Why? What happened? For a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart since you have been born again. Not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. Verse 25, it says, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. What does that mean? That when the gospel is preached, when the word of God goes forward, it can make a soul that is dead in its sins and trespasses that needs to be born again, born again. And that born again life begins to blossom to someone with sincere brotherly love. And it begins to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. What our country needs, what we need, what the church needs is people who are born again, resurrected through the Resurrection of Jesus Christ that love each other from a pure heart with sincere love. And that's the power of born again. No program will change us. No law will change us. Only the gospel of Jesus has the power to make you born again. Verse 25, this is the word, the good news that was preached to you. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the power of God that brings us back to life. It is the power that can cause us to be born again unto sincere brotherly love. The very thing that every protester is organizing for and every marcher is marching for, it is only possible through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our hearts need a resurrection the church needs the resurrection power of Christ to love one another earnestly. This is the fruit of the gospel, and this is how hearts are going to change. And yet, what we find is that people stumble over the gospel. People trip and are offended by the gospel. Peter points this out in verse 8 of chapter 2, and he says, a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. You see, there is an offense to the gospel, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. But we must understand that even though we know as Christians that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, it does cause offense, and people will stumble over the gospel. Jesus is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And yet he is the cornerstone, we just sang about it, of the story of God. Everything, every chapter, every verse, everything is built on him. He is the chief cornerstone, and we are being built up as a spiritual temple on him. He is the living stone, and we are the living stones, it says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 5. And yes, people will trip over the gospel. But it says that those who believe in him will not be put to shame. Yes, Jesus was rejected by men. And in these days, we may be rejected by men, but not in the sight of God. Because Jesus, though he was rejected by men, he was chosen and precious. You see, he is, in fact, the living stone raised from the dead. And those who are born again, who have heard the gospel and believe, they are being built up into this spiritual house, a spiritual temple. Yes, we are the living stones built on the living stone. This is our part in the story of God. And we're going to continue to see how this unfolds in these few verses. And yet it says here in chapter 2, verse 3, that this is only the case for those who have tasted that the Lord is good. And that's a great question this morning as we are talking about the gospel and your part in the story of God. Have you tasted and seen that the Lord is good? Because it says that for those who have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, that they crave spiritual milk. Like an infant longs for its mother's milk. For very sustenance and life itself, the infant 
cries and craves for its mother's milk, so as those who have tasted that the Lord is indeed good, they crave spiritual milk. They crave the word of God. They crave the gospel of Jesus Christ. They crave to know their part in the story of God. During this time of division and crisis in our nation, it's worth noting that those who are born again must not only crave the gospel like infants crave their mother's milk, but rid ourselves and put away Verse 1, chapter 2, put away all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. And as we see this morning, we have a high calling in Christ Jesus. Our part, our role in the story of God is literally marvelous, wonderful, beyond our wildest imagination. And therefore, it demands that we put away anything that shades its light. Church, we are called to let our light shine in this dark world, not to hide it under a bushel. No. Mm. Therefore, we must put away on a daily basis anything, church, that quenches our love for one another. Because this is the aim of being born again, to love one another earnestly, sincerely from a pure heart. And so that's why Peter, in the midst of this description of who we are and our part, he says, in light of all of this, you must put away these five things. And briefly, because I believe that these five things hinder our ability to love one another sincerely. And because they hinder our ability to love one another sincerely and deeply from the heart. And right now what our nation is craving, what our country needs more than anything, is love. Sincere, brotherly love. These five sins listed here in chapter 2, verse 1. They tear at the social fabric of the church. They rip away the threads of love that keep us together. And so I just want to elaborate really quickly on each one. Malice. Peter says, put that away. Malice is a feeling of hostility, a strong dislike with a possible implication of desiring to do harm, a hateful feeling. And church, if that means you need to put away social media, if that means you can't troll in the comments, if that means you can't get on Twitter, whatever it may mean, if you can't watch the news, if that doesn't, if it is causing some feeling of hostility or strong dislike towards someone, then you need to put it away. Put it away. Rid yourself of malice. The next, he says, is deceit. Deceit is being used, is using trickery and falsehood of setting something out there as bait. Do you ever find yourself throwing out a comment or a phrase or a sentence or a word that you're just waiting for someone to trip over, trying to trick them and get them to stumble upon some sin? You need to put away all deception, all deceit, hypocrisy, playing a part, pretending this was great. The hiding of interior wickedness under the appearance of virtue. Though you may be virtuous on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, is it hiding something underneath? We need to put away hypocrisy. Anything that would give an impression of having certain purposes or motivations while in reality having quite different ones. We need to put away hypocrisy, put away deceit, Put away malice. We need to put away envy. What is envy? It's grudging regard for the advantages seen to be enjoyed by others. Do you see someone in society gaining something? Do you see a people group in society gaining something and you are envious of them? Why are they being looked at? Why are they having advantage instead of rejoicing? You see... Envy is a state of ill will towards someone because of some real or presumed advantages. We need to put away envy. And lastly, what Paul or Peter says is that we need to put away slander. Slander is that whispering secrecy of sharing evil reports or speaking against and speaking evil of one another. You see, these five sins that we are commanded to put away and to rid ourselves of. They are detrimental 
to the church. They are detrimental to the loving community that we are called to be, that born-again believers are to be. It reminded me of the words of Paul in Galatians 5, 13 to 16. Brothers, sisters, you were called to freedom. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. I say walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Watch out, you are not consumed by one another. And it grieved me as I read that this morning. And I looked at the news, and I looked on social media, and I just see people biting and devouring one another. And they're being consumed by one another. And church, how do we escape this? Do we use our freedom for ourselves, or do we use our freedom to serve one another? To walk in the role and the part of the story of God that God has called us to. You see, if we focus on the desires of the flesh, it will not work. We must walk by the Spirit. In other words, we must begin to learn what our part is, what our role is, and begin to walk in the Spirit, to follow step in step where He is taking us. You see, let us learn this morning to walk by the Spirit, to exercise our freedom in Christ, to serve one another, to crave the spiritual milk that grows us up in our salvation, that makes us more and more like Jesus. We have a part to play in the story of God, Lodi Community Church, and this is serious, urgent business these days. In verse 9, Peter is contrasting your part, church, our part, church, with those who stumble and are offended by the gospel, those who are disobedient to the gospel, those who refuse to trust in Jesus, those who are dominated by the flesh and do not walk by the Spirit. And he contrasts those who are stumbling and disobedient to those who are called to be something, to play their part in the story of God, in the theater of history. So therefore, church, we must see that playing our part in these days is critical in the chaos of our country. Perhaps no better place for us to look and discover our part in the story of God is found in all of Scripture than in 1 Peter 2. 9 through 10. And you, as you hear this, it's probably a familiar verse if you've been in church for a while. But I just implore you this morning, do not let the word of God fall to the ground. This word must be believed, as we looked at last week, and behave. I need you this morning to believe your part in the story of God. But not just believe it. Because James says that what? Even the demons believe but they do not behave the gospel. They might believe in God, but they do not behave as they should. And so church, just believing that, yes, I'm a, I'm a royal priest, I'm a chosen race, does nothing. We must believe our part and behave our part. We must believe the gospel and behave the gospel in everyday life. I pray that as we hear the word this morning, that it would find expression in our everyday life, that we would compare it to our everyday activities and the struggles and what we are seeing on the news, and we would search and crave for some gospel application, some implication, because being a royal priesthood, being a chosen race, being a people belonging to God, being a person who lives in view of the mercy of God means something. It cannot just be something we believe. It must be something we behave. You see, who the church is today, our part, it's a faint reflection of who we will be in the eternal kingdom. You see, 
This is called inaugurated eschatology, and it's a fancy word that basically means that the kingdom of God is already, when Jesus came and he died and he rose from the dead, the kingdom is already here through the power of the Holy Spirit, but it's not yet. We look towards a day where the kingdom of God and every tribe and every tongue gather around the phone, around the throne and worship God. You see, even though the kingdom is already not yet, we do not wait only for the return of the king. Yes, we say, Jesus, come. I don't know if you've thought this over the last few days and weeks. Maranatha, Jesus, please come, right? But we, we don't just wait, sitting in our chairs, sitting in our pews, waiting for Jesus to come so that everything will be all right and we don't do anything in the meantime. This calling, this part in the story of God is something that we must put to work today. This week, in light of all that's going on. You see, understanding who we are and our part in the story of God propels us to pray and work out the Lord's Prayer. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And yes, one day his kingdom will fully come. And yes, one day his will will be fully done. But our part in the story of God in this age, in this hour, is to mirror to the nations the glory of God. Because we are a chosen race and we are a royal priesthood. You see, now it's God's kingdom of priests. The church is God's kingdom of priests. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are a royal priesthood. And it is our job to mediate, to dispense God's blessings to the nations as we proclaim the gospel. You see, what Paul is encapsulating in these two verses is that the church is the fulfillment of everything that Israel was supposed to be. Everything, all of the titles, all of the responsibility, all of the privileges, all of Abraham's blessings, all of that found its apex in Jesus Christ, who was the true Adam, the true Moses, the true Abraham, the true Israel. And because we are in Christ by faith, because we have been born again, we find ourselves as part of Israel, of God's chosen people. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation set apart. We are a people for his own possession. He's jealous of his glory. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, this is who we are, church. This is who we are. The whole story of scripture is culminating in the church because of Jesus, he's the living stone and we are the living stones that are building this spiritual house, this spiritual temple. You see, because of Jesus being our cornerstone and our lives being built on him, we are the fulfillment of everything in the story of scripture until he comes. And we are working for that. We are praying for that. We are a, a, a trailer, a, a promotional bumper for the kingdom of God that is to come. This is who we are, church. And yet, it's in Revelation that we see the very same language of 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. Revelation being the, the, the end of the book, the last book in the Bible, where we see the end drawing near, a picture. And it says, this is where the story is headed. And yet, somehow, what we see at the end is what Peter is exhorting us to be now. For example, in chapter 1, as Jesus is revealing himself to John, it says this in verse 6. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. You see, right here, as 
Jesus begins to unfold the, the end of human history. He reminds John of who we are, that Jesus loved us, that he freed us by his blood. Why? Why did Jesus love us and free us with his blood and forgive us of our sins to make us a kingdom of priests to his God the Father? You see, as we are looking at our part, as we are looking at our role, that we are a chosen race, a royal priest, and a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. As we are seeing our part, we must believe it and we must behave it. In chapter 5 of Revelation, around the throne, they're singing a new song and they're saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and with your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and people and nation, and you have made them a what? A kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. We are a chosen race, Peter says. But what does that mean? Yeah, race is in the news these days. Racism, I believe, is not a skin problem, as you may have seen. It's a sin problem. At the heart of racism is the belief that I am better than you because of my skin color or because of my ethnicity. And yet what we find here in this passage is the glorious news, the good news, that the calling of Israel, ethnic Israel, those who were biological descendants from Abraham, that ethnic Israel, that it's calling to be a royal priesthood, it's calling to be a chosen race, it's calling to be a holy nation, it's calling to be a people for his own possession, it's calling to proclaim the excellencies of him who called them out of darkness and into his marvelous light, that what ethnic Israel lost is fulfilled in the body of Christ. Ultimately, it's fulfilled in Jesus as the head, as, and then we receive the benefits as his body. He's the living stone. We're the living stones. You see, the glorious news of these verses is that the calling of Israel, ethnic Israel, is now fulfilled in Jesus and his body, the earthly temple, the church. The church does not replace Israel, but it does fulfill the promises made to Israel and all those Jews and Gentiles who belong to the true Israel are now part of the new people of God. You are the people of God if your faith is in Jesus. You see, one commentator says this, all of the descriptors in verses 9 and 10, chosen race, royal priesthood, holy nation, God's own possession, his people, those who have received his mercy, belonged originally to the nation of Israel. But here, Peter is applying them to both Jewish and Gentile believers. And if you don't know what a Gentile believer is, if you're not Jewish, that's you. <laughs> the Israel of God and all of its responsibilities and privileges are not limited to those who are descended biologically from Abraham but encompass those who are united to the Davidic king whose throne has now been universalized, Jesus. You see, something happened with Israel. Ethnic Israel placed its confidence in its ethnic righteousness. Because they were ethnically Jews, they thought that that would make them better than everyone else. They grew proud of their Abrahamic lineage and fearful of the other nations because they were different. They were not like them. However, they forgot that it was always, hear this, always God's intent to bless the nations through them. However, their ethnic pride became their downfall. And instead of being God's royal priesthood, who stood in the place of heaven and earth, where heaven and earth collided and reflect God's glory to the nations and mediate God's blessings to the nations. Instead of being that, they became ethnocentric. And that led to their exile and their enslavement, God's judgment. And yet, it's interesting here that Peter 
says that we are a chosen race and people group. In other words, and this is a big idea this morning, God's grace, rather than human choice, effort, or righteousness, defines us. As a chosen people, it's not that we chose, it's that we were chosen. It's God's grace, his sovereign grace that defines us being God's people. And because of that, there's no boasting. The gospel eliminates all boasting because it's not based on human effort or human work or human righteousness or ethnic righteousness or any other type of righteousness that we try to muster up in our own strength. The gospel eliminates all of that. And I believe that at the heart of racism or ethnic pride or ethnic righteousness is this idea that I'm better than you because blank. Yeah. Right? As we read in Jeremiah, our human heart is desperately sick. Remember, it's an idol factory. We desperately are searching for something, anything to make us somebody or something that separates us from others. You see, it could be our socioeconomic righteousness. It could be our religious works righteousness. It could be our ethnic righteousness. It could be our family righteousness. Really, the list could go on and on and on. And here's a plug for Wednesday night Bible study. This is exactly what we're talking about this Wednesday at 630. So hopefully see you at Lodi Community Church. But this idea of putting our hope and confidence in some man-made righteousness, it's at the heart of sin itself. We want to be like God instead of receiving life freely from him. You see, this could go on and on, but it's something in our life that makes us feel superior to others. And that's why the gospel, honestly, I believe, is the remedy to our racism, to our false righteousness problem. The gospel says that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, that we've all sinned, and that all of our righteousness or Whatever we have put our confidence in to make us right with God and better than others is filthy rags. Paul actually calls it rubbish or dumb hoop in Philippians. In other words, there's no place for any works righteousness, any ethnic righteousness, any socioeconomic righteousness, however you may define it, in the life of a Christian. And this is why people stumble and are offended by the gospel. Because we inherently, in our flesh, want to claim credit for something. Something that separates us. Something that makes us better than you. We want to take the glory for the things that we do. Because then we are the responsible party. We are the captain of our, our ship. We are the ones who is responsible for our success and our righteousness. But the gospel says, no. All of your works, all of your righteousness is filthy rags. But yet, church, we are a chosen race. Defined by the grace of God, his undeserved favor, not our human effort, not our choices. There is equal footing at the foot of the cross because we are all sinners and we all need a savior. And the gospel promises us an alien righteousness, a foreign righteousness, something outside of ourselves. The righteousness of Christ himself received by faith alone, in Christ alone, by grace alone, to the glory of God alone. And this is how we live in the view of the mercy of God like we talked about last week. Because everything is mercy, church. And if we have received mercy, then we can show mercy to others. And we can be the good Samaritan. We can fight for justice. We can stand with those that are oppressed. Because we are not better than anyone. We are a chosen race by grace. Not because of anything we did. So in this posture of humility, living in the view of the mercy of God, we can be a royal priesthood. We can declare the praises of God. In every tongue, to every tribe, to every nation. Because we were in darkness, but now we stand in marvelous light because of the mercy of God. You see, this righteousness transcends our socioeconomic status, our ethnicity, our culture. It becomes the defining feature of our life. And it has the power to unite us around something outside of ourselves and reconcile the nations. 
You see, one commentator says this, irrespective of ethnicity, believers have been united by faith in Jesus to be a new people, a new race. The kind of race has nothing to do with ethnicity precisely because this race is composed of every ethnicity. It is a spiritual race, a chosen race, defined not by color or culture, but by Christ. This race is defined by the one in whom we believe, Jesus. And that is why we see around the throne singing a new song before Jesus. A choir of every tribe and every language and every people group and every nation. And this doesn't mean that we ignore every tribe and tongue's unique culture or part. But instead of ignoring it, we ignite it. We amplify it. Imagine with me that every culture, every tribe, every tongue is like a broken piece of glass that makes up this marvelous mosaic, a mosaic of mercy. And when the light of the gospel, the light of the world, Jesus shines through every single unite culture. It's the glory of God on full display because this is what heaven looks like. And church, this is what we should look like if we are to reflect the glory of God in the earth. This mosaic of mercy, a diverse, unified group of people anchored in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, in closing, we are united by the mercy of God. And that's what it says at the end in verse 10. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We are defined by the mercy of God. And so therefore we must live in view of the mercy of God. And in such a light, we cannot help but to love one another sincerely. Because we see in every man, in every woman, in every color, we see their need for mercy. And because we have received mercy, because we have been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light, because we have received mercy, we freely extend mercy. And mercy is the thing that unites us and brings us together. Church, let's be a marvelous mosaic of mercy. Let's unite and honor and cherish every unique culture. But at the end of the day, we are defined by Jesus and his righteousness by mercy. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your mercy. Lord, we need mercy in these days. And so may we be those people who, in view of your mercy, offer our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to you. We need you, Jesus. Help us wrestle malice and hypocrisy, envy, deceit. Help us wrestle with these things. Help us wrestle with the idols of our heart. Help us be rooted in the marvelous mercy and grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We say these things in amen. We have one more song. I encourage you just to process everything that you just heard. Cry out for mercy for yourself. Remember the mercy of God. Pray for mercy for others. Be a people of mercy. Let's continue to worship, and then I'll come back and lead us in closing with a benediction.
the sweetest friend But holy trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone We can make strong in the same
this benediction. It's out of Micah 6 8. I know it's been on the hearts of many people these days. But in Micah 6 8, it says this. So, however you want to receive this blessing, whether you have your hands out quietly or sitting, whatever posture you want to be in to receive, here is the blessing. Micah 6 8. He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice? Love kindness and walk humbly with your God. Because of mercy, we can do justice, we can love kindness, and we can walk humbly with God. Amen. Be blessed. Have a great weekend.